Grab a seat, grab a seat, grab a seat. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, one of the uh, perks of being at a place that we don't own is that we can't control the lights today. So um, I thought about being right here, but I don't even know if you can see me very well. So I'm going to come back here. Uh, thank the Lord for technology that carries through speakers. Uh, hey, shout out to those in the back row. Give me a wave. Yeah, I see you. Love you. Hopefully you can, you can see me. I don't know. It just feels like I'm really far from all of you. I love you. Um, this isn't me trying to distance myself, okay? Uh, my name is Glenn. I serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm really glad you're here this morning because we are closing our sermon series in the book of James. So if you brought your Bible today, if you are one of those special people that bring your physical Bible to church on a Sunday morning, we applaud you. Uh, you are noble among us, and we need more people like you. So open your Bible to the book of James. We're going to be in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Now I want to, I want to break something to you. Um, we are preaching, I'm preaching two verses this morning. It's the last two verses in the book of James. And um, if you happen to be new with us, this book in the Bible is really, really practical. Um, it's so practical that there are more uh, imperative verbs uh, per words in James than there is in any other New Testament book. Very applicable. The whole goal of James, who was Jesus' younger brother while he was on the earth, kind of amazing, a spiritual influence in the early church, and he's writing this to dispersed Jewish Christians. He's saying, hey, is your faith real? Is your faith genuine? Do you, would you raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I would put that on my Facebook. I would say that publicly. If someone asked me, do you have a religion? Would you say, I'm a Christian? James would say, okay, let's walk through a series of litmus tests that show what living and active faith looks like versus faith that is dead and useless faith. Um, the whole thing that's undergirding the book of James is that he's acknowledging, and it's just hard, it's just hard, He's acknowledging there's people in the church, in the body of Christ, who would profess the name of Jesus, who are not actually born again. They're not actually saved. They don't actually have salvation. And, and so he begins to try to draw some lines and say, hey, self-examine. Does what you say about your faith bear itself out through the evidence of how you live? Is there fruit in your life to what's rooted in here, in your heart? And so, in chapter 1, James says, you know, what's our, uh, what's our mental and emotional response to trials? He asks, how do we respond to temptation in our life? What's our response to the Word of God? When we open up this book, we believe that we can take God at His Word. This has been preserved for us. When we read this, and it pertains commands— do we read them and say, that's a great thought, and walk away, or are we obedient? Do we do what the Word of God says rather than just only hearing it? And he moves to chapter 2. How do we respond to all kinds of people? Are we poisoned by prejudice? Do we classify different people in different ways? And chapter 3, what kind of speech comes out of our mouth? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It says, what kind of wisdom is characteristic of our life? Do, do we tend to want to consult ourselves more than anybody else when it comes to decision making? Or do we want to consult God? Do we have a picture for what his wisdom looks like when it bears itself out in our life versus the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of our neighbor, the wisdom of our parents, the wisdom of our spouse, or our own wisdom? Now, what is our attitude toward God's will? Are we actually submitted to God's sovereign plan? Are we submitted to the fact that we're not guaranteed tomorrow? Are we, are we submitted to his will for our lives? Um, what about this? What about our response to the world? Do we love the world? Do we have a really close friendship with the world? Do we gladly swim in the world's 
current. Um, in chapter 5, what's our attitude toward riches? Are we worshipful stewards of what God has given us? Are we patient and trusting when we undergo suffering? Does that mark us? Are we patient people? And finally, are we living in prayer? Do we have an interactive, ongoing, convictional, personal, faith-filled dialogue with God that was purchased for us by Jesus? Are we asking and seeking and knocking? Are we wanting closeness with him? What I've just done is summarized all of the different things that James talks about throughout this book. This is what we've been exploring for the last few months. All of these are are tests and, and, and weights and measures that show evidence of whether our faith is real or not, whether it's living or it's dead. And at the heart of this epistle, I think, is a call to faith, salvation. Um, If you look with me, it won't be up on the screen, but you can just listen in in James chapter 4. Starting in verse 7, here's what James says. Submit yourselves therefore to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Don't miss this. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. The whole point of James is for a person to know that they've humbled themselves before God. Jesus has saved them. The Spirit has taken residence within them, and they have assurance that they are a changed person from the inside out. So, by way of introduction uh, to this final sermon, sermon, I just want to understand, want us to understand what James is up to throughout this whole thing. Um, Underlying all these imperatives, and I mentioned this, there's this sobering reality that in the church there are are both false believers and they're sown in the same field, if you will, as true believers. Um, There are people who profess Jesus but don't actually possess Jesus. There are people whose faith is alive, people whose faith is dead. There are hearers but not doers. There are church attenders who have not been born again and who are self-deceived. And so I I bear that weight to tell you the title of this morning's message and where we're going to go. The title is called Saving a Soul. Saving a Soul. You want to know why I titled this morning's sermon that? It's because that is precisely, literally, believe it or not, the language James uses to describe what you and I do in one another's lives. Did you hear that? Does it sound blasphemous to you that I would say, you and I can save a soul? You say, that not that God's work? Doesn't God do that? And we're going to get to that. But James says in the closing of this book, hey, all these things have been said. Now listen, the way this is going to be tended to in the life of the church, the way any church is going to have integrity, there goes a page of James. Clearly I've been reading... James a lot. Time for a new Bible. So, I still have this morning's text. Okay. He's saying if for, for a church to have uh, integrity, integrity, and for a church to be the church that God has designed it to be, we actually have to participate when we see fruitlessness and when we see wandering and, and straying and when we see drifting in the body of Christ— We don't just sit back and comment on it. We do something about it in one another's lives. And God's word is going to tell us that that is saving a soul from death. That it's it's covering over a multitude of sins. So um, here's where we're going this morning. You and I are probably right now, if I had to guess, if you're anything like me, 
aware of people in this church family who may not be here this morning, people in your blood family, people you work with, people in your neighborhood, who either one, you know that they are not a follower of Jesus and you have carried a burden for a long time to say something, to do something, and you've just never acted on it. It's always been intention, but it's never been action. The second is that this person is a Christian, but like any of us, they're weak. Life is made up of seasons, y'all. Guess what? Sometimes we wander, we stray. Sometimes our relationship with God doesn't feel close and and powerful and, and anointed and we are weak. What a blessing to be able to come into a place like CLB and look at one another and say, great, me too. Me, me too. God has given all of us a race to run. He's, he's put something in front of us that is going to end at a finish line one day and it's going to command faithfulness from us. It doesn't just happen by osmosis. We have to persevere. And my burden for us is that we see we need one another for this. There's not some online YouTube pastor that can do it who doesn't know you, doesn't know what you're walking through, can't call out the actual things that he or she is seeing in your life. There's not, there's not a, a person that, that, that's in this church that you see once every you know, other Sunday morning and, and you wave and say hi that knows anything about what's going on in your life. This is a command for community. This is a draw for us to have Christian friendships and and relationships and how crucial and vital they are in our journey with Jesus. So I want to pray and we're going to dive into these two verses. God, right now, you have the floor. Thank you for the ways that your Holy Spirit has already been ministering in our midst. We just want to declare that we trust you. We know that your word goes forth and it does not return void. I already know that this morning, Spirit, you will minister in personal, powerful ways to everyone in this room that would have ears to hear, eyes to see. Praying that your word falls in healthy soil. Whatever seeds are sown this morning, would grow and bear much fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 5, verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, I'll stop right there. First, I want to just point out how he addresses his audience. My brothers, okay? In today's language, that's my brothers and sisters, my siblings in Christ. Why is it important that James would would say this? Well, first of all, I just want to say the Apostle Paul, who has, I think, 13 letters in the New Testament, in all of his 13 letters combined, he uses the phrase, my brothers, my brothers and sisters, eight times in all 13 letters. In one letter, James uses that phrase the same amount of times as Paul does in 13. So what that says and signals to us is he really, really wants to remind these dispersed Jews who are following Jesus that wherever people believe in Jesus Christ, there a family is formed. Wherever people come together and believe in Jesus, a family, a spiritual family is born in that place. That's happened here at City Light Bennington. Whether you want to walk in it or not, we have all been called. The, the, the word for the church is the ecclesia, the called out ones. We are the people of God. And family is so much different. It's so much different than an organization. Family, according to the word of God, means so much more than any organization that we would be familiar with today. When you say, I'm a Christian, you are saying at the same time, I am a family member in the household of God. Now, some of you, that's like, that's kind of weird. You're like, I have, I have family. <laughs> I don't need a second family. Um, 
God's vision is that we would have a shared friend in Jesus, that we would have a mutual brother in Jesus, that we would have a mutual good shepherd, that we would mutually drink of living water, that we would have a mutual bread of life, that there would be a mutual truth that we trust in, that we would have a mutual way, truth, and life, that all of us together would mutually love Jesus. And this faith in him makes us one new people, makes us one blood. The blood of Jesus runs in our veins and no other community on earth. And we need to fight for this. No other community on earth should have the kind of togetherness, the kind of belonging, the kind of oneness that the church has. Shame on us if we treat our local church like an organization that meets in a building and we go to, to receive some religious goods and services and then go home, not to be known or to know anyone in that church. I don't say that to you to make you feel bad. I say that to you because your vision of the church, if that's you, is way different than God's vision of his church. We don't get to define what church is, y'all. We don't get to define it. God defines it. It belongs to him. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd of the church. Our relationships ought to have a, a depth. They ought to have a patience. They ought to have a long suffering. They ought to have a graciousness and a forgiveness. And I want to continue because it is so good for us to um, decrease in our independence and to increase in our obligations to one another. That's part of what makes the church the church. And that's so good for us that that would happen. That's why James continues the verse. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth. What does that mean? What does it mean to wander from the truth? Well, the truth in its essence is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth is that Jesus Christ is God truth is that God is working in redemptive history right now to bring all things reconciled to himself. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sin, live the life that we couldn't live to be a substitute in our life and then to be a substitute in death on that cross. He rose again. Jesus Christ rose again from the grave. Jesus is resurrected. We, guess what? We have a mutual resurrection and life in him. And, and, and Jesus is coming back again and he rules and he reigns and he has all authority. And for someone to begin to wander from the truth, I love that word wander because it may or may not be just a deliberate departure. It could just be, think about the picture of wandering. That somebody's just drifting slowly but surely. I remember in college, a guy that invested in me above me, he, he, a class ahead of me, he would always tell me, hey man, there is no such thing as neutral in your Christian faith. Like if you think that you can just sit and be neutral, you're declining and you're growing in distance from God. And that's going to eat you up and sin is going to take hold of you. It's going to devour you. He said, you have to put one foot in front of the other. You have to fight for your faith. You have to fight for time spent with God. You have to fight for relationship with him. To think you're in neutral is to be declining. And so when someone wanders from the truth, it can be both doctrinal, right? That all of a sudden, someone has a second guess about, I don't really believe that Jesus is exclusively the way to heaven. I've changed my mind on that. Uh, I think it's all the same thing and leads to the same place. And I have a different interpretation when Jesus says that no one comes to the Father except through me. Um, I could go on and on, but it can also be behavioral. I think of Galatians chapter 2, Paul has this confrontation with the Apostle Peter. And the language he uses is, your conduct is out of step with the gospel. So it's one thing to profess, right? It's another thing to 
to live and, and pursue and, and follow Jesus as his disciple, as his student, as his learner. And so when someone's wandering from the truth, it could be both behavioral, both doctrinal, but here's what I want to press in today. What happens typically when we see someone struggling in their faith? Okay, I want to get real here. (laughs) I've thought about this. I've thought about what's kind of the, the, the normal circumstance. Here's what typically characterizes us when we sense that someone around us is wandering or drifting. We start conversing with one another about how that person isn't showing up anymore. How is so-and-so doing? Where have they been? Yeah, they had kind of a weird thing about politics, so like it kind of makes sense. Um, You know, they had a a tiny Bible, so, you know, um, they didn't bring their Bible to church. They let their 12-year-old watch a PG-13 movie, so I kind of saw it written on on the wall. You know, I saw that post they made. Can, I, can we get real? I saw that post they made on social media. It's kind of like, kind of read into that and eh, it seemed like they're kind of struggling. Um, I don't know. They, they told me they watched Game of Thrones. So like, <laughs> they're probably not saved. Okay, we laugh at this, but, but church, we do this. I do this. We participate in this. It, it's so opposite of the, the heart of God. We, we share and we, we gab and we gossip and we have all these thoughts on the state of someone's faith and, and the most revealing thing is that no one actually does anything. I felt that. No one actually does anything none of us are as good and faithful at pursuing the wanderer as we are about talking about them. None of us are as as good at making margin in our life to invite a conversation and to care and have compassion enough to go and do something and say something as we are assessing where they are and what do you think and do you think it's because this happened in their life and let's counsel them without counseling them when they're not even in the room. I can't imagine how much that grieves the Holy Spirit when that's the posture that we so regularly take. Matthew 18, 12 through 14, Jesus says, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it's not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That's God's heart. Uh, we have songs that are all about this. <laughs> like we, we apply that to us. Uh, I was, uh, I'm overwhelmed by how good God was that I was the one and he sought me and we'll sing about it and we'll tell our story and we'll, we'll testify, but don't expect us to live that out with real people in our life. Don't expect me to actually go out of my way to make myself uncomfortable for the sake of another and say, how are you doing? Hey, I've seen and observed this. Am I missing something? Is there something going on behind the scenes? And we live in a day and age where people are so hidden. That much more do we need to be people who are willing to knock on the door, send the text, make the phone call. Can I buy you lunch? Can I drop by the office? Can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? How's your soul? Do you even walk with Jesus anymore? There's a way to do this and a way not to do this, right? The way to do it is to say, I'm right there with you. I'm a sheep too. I go astray too. I get into seasons of doubt, frustration. I question Christianity. I wonder if it's all true. We, we've all been in places where whatever life circumstances bring us, whatever this deceitful thing, this weak thing that's within us that can just go anywhere in any direction, wherever it takes us, in our flesh, like we've been there. We should lean into that when we want to talk to somebody about 
things that we've seen in their life, we should say, I can really relate to that. Hey, but me too. <laughs> can we talk about that? Because I'm coming here to encourage you. You might actually really encourage me as well. Um, none of us is above feelings that we are maybe not even like a Christian anymore. None of us are above feelings that Jesus is distant. We don't have a hunger for his word. We feel hopeless. We feel despair. We fear when the, the most oft command in scripture is to not fear. Um, we, none of us is above that. Like we all are human beings here. Have you ever been in that situation and had someone come and check on you? Have you ever had a friend come to you like a brother or a sister and call that out and say, I'm seeing you drift? I have. And let me tell you something. I get real defensive. <laughs> I do not like being told all the ways that I am failing and I don't like, you know, being told the things I'm doing wrong and blah, blah. How about a, some encouragement? <laughs> like, can you name and affirm some of the things I'm doing well? Like, we're all wired like this. We're so needy. We really are. Anytime someone, I think of in particular one scenario a few years ago where a friend came to me and um, asked me how my quiet times were. I thought, well, it's none of your business how my quiet times are. What are you talking about how my quiet times are? And it was because this bro sensed that I was numb and not walking close to God. And he had discernment to see that. So he asked me, and I was so defensive at first, he probably wouldn't have known. But inside, you know, you know that boiling feeling of like, who is this? Who do you think you, you know? Once that passes though, do y'all know what's waiting on the other side of that? You know the blessing that's waiting on the other side of that? To actually have an honest conversation with self-examination. And what's the end goal? I'm closer with God now. I'm closer to Jesus than I was before. How am I going to hate on that man for coming to me and loving me enough to call that out? It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's pain-free. But it is so necessary. And that's why in James 5, 20, I just want to read 19 and 20 to take us into 20 in closing. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone, notice that doesn't say the pastor it doesn't say when the city group leader brings him back. It doesn't say when the veteran senior Christian brings him back, when the paid staff at the church brings him back. Someone. When anyone among you wanders and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering, check out this promise, will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Wow. I wonder, church, if we see what this is saying about Christian community. I wonder if we are reading this and we're actually seeing the role and the responsibility that God is entrusting to us. Let me offer an analogy. Okay? There's a lumberjack, there's an axe, and there's a tree. What cuts the tree? The lumberjack or the axe? Both. God Saving people from death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God saving people from sin and covering a multitude of sin. Saving them from death and covering a multitude of sin. What is the instrument he uses to do that? You and me. Do you see the weight of this? He's not pointing to anything or anyone else. He's not just saying the pastor that preaches from the pulpit on Sundays. He's saying brothers, sisters, if anyone among you wonders, guess who it's on? You. You. If you see it, act on it. Pursue that person and invite them in. And Man, uh, is there anything more significant than God? The Lord of salvation, the forgiver of sin, uh, the, the one who saves, that he could give you, my friend, to do as his agent than to save a person's soul and cover their sin by pursuing them and bringing them back home to faith. Wow. Wow. James doesn't offer a, 
we'll see you later. Hope things are well with that person. And blah, blah. It doesn't give any greeting, farewell at all. These are the verses he leaves them with. Save one another. Rescue one another. Fight for one another. Show up for one another. This is life and death. Now, let me offer some clarity if you need it, okay? Believers may fall into sin through neglect, through temptation, whereby they, they, they grieve the Holy Spirit, they, they impair closeness with God and, and comforts from Him. They even may have temporal judgment for foolish living. But I want you to know this isn't about losing your salvation and gaining it back again. Um, when a person is born again, when, when they're united to Jesus, when they've been adopted into the family of God with God as their Abba Father, those things aren't undone. But all true believers will persevere in faith. Matthew 24, Jesus says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so don't miss this. Man, here in James, God's word is showing us how instrumental we are in each other's lives to that end. Do you see this? We need each other to persevere. We need one another to evidence and, and improve and, and fight to show that our faith is living and that it will last all the way to the finish line and the race that's been set before you. And so I want to ask you, do you need to have a conversation with somebody? Do you need to send the text, make the call, invite them over? Do you need to check in on somebody? The biggest lie that Satan wants you to believe, and I've said this before, the biggest lie is that someone else will. Someone else will. Someone else will do that. Someone else's job, not mine. And Satan eats that up when all of us in here who are meant to be an interdependent body of members in the body of Christ, he eats it up when all of us collectively say someone else will. And we all assume that somebody else is going to do it, and in turn, none of us do it. Do you know what happens as a result of that? People drift, stray, wander, suffer silently. And none of us step in to take hold of what God has put before us. Listen, Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Another translation, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. I want to um, close this morning uh, with two applications. The first precedes any of this. And it is for the person in the room who you have been a part of church. Maybe you were married in church. You grew up associated with church. You've always been associated with the Christian thing. You've always been associated with Jesus. Um, you would call yourself a Christian, but your conscience deep down is saying, I have never actually, truly given over ownership of my life to him. I've never actually repented and turned from sin against him. I've never actually asked him to forgive me. I've never actually surrendered my life to him. If that's you this morning, if God is speaking to you, please do not harden your heart. Let today be the day that you bow your knee and you entrust your life to the one who made you, that you be saved from death and that a multitude of sin in your life would be covered through forgiveness because of the shed blood of Jesus. Do not walk out of this building today without doing that business with God. 
and giving your life to him. The second thing is some of you in this room, you couldn't even apply this to your life because you're not in fellowship with people. What, the, what I mean by that is nobody knows you. Nobody knows what's going on in your life. Nobody knows any trials that you are dealing with. Nobody knows. With one step of faith for you to step into other people's life, jump into a city group, invite a family over for dinner, whatever it looks like for you to build relationship here. What's waiting on the other side of that is people who can actually fight for you, people who can actually hold up your arms, people who can help share and bear burdens in your life. Right now, you're the hero of your story. You're the savior. You're supposed to figure it out. And something has convinced you in our American Western Christianity that a relationship with Jesus is only this. It's only vertical. It's you and it's him and it's private. This says nothing of that alone. That's the starting place. But it grows itself out horizontally to where you have family that you belong to. You have people that love you and encourage you and will show up in your life and you the same for them. So please take whatever steps you need to take. I will make myself available after this down right in front of the stage here. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you have questions about that, come and talk to me. If you're someone in the room who is not connected in any way in our church beyond just attending here in a seat on Sunday, come and talk to me. I'd love to help introduce you to people and meet people. It will change your life to be in community. I want to close in prayer and I want to pray over us that um, God would actually give us the, the unction, the courage to, to take a step to have these kinds of conversations. Would you do that with me? Lord, right now we are asking Please give us the courage for the family member that we wanted to talk to at Thanksgiving and we just couldn't muster up the questions. Let it happen at Christmas. God, for the coworker we've been working with for five years and we've always wanted to venture into this, give us the courage. God, for our spouse who we sense is in a bad place and we don't talk about these things, Give us the courage to check in on his or her heart in the relationship with Jesus. God, for each of us in the room who might be, Lord, please, please help us, who might be the receptive end of this, who might be the, the person receiving questions, give us the grace to see it as your grace. God, give us eyes to see this is your uncomfortable grace to us that we would have people in our life who care enough to say something and ask something. And we pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.